All right, folks, today we're going to continue answering the question that was asked by Aki. Are mutations really random? Or is something else going on here? This question is really cool to ask because there's a large spectrum of thought on this with inside the scientific community and outside the scientific community. One of the things that a lot of people assume when they first learn about evolution is that mutations must be maximally random. You'll hear people say that there's random mutations and then there's natural selection. Well, that must mean that mutations are maximally random. Another thought is that random mutations are naturally biased due to physical constraints. DNA is a physical structure. It lives in a physical world. The cell is a physical structure. So right here, I have some computer tape from an old computer, an old Russian computer. Computers used to store information on tape like this. And so these dots, the dots and non-dots, the holes and non-holes, that is data stored in this piece of paper. And what you can see here is that because this is a physical data storage, some sequences of data are more physically strong than other sequences of data. You know, sometimes there's lots of holes, sometimes there's not so many holes. So if I were to pull on this really hard, it's gonna break according to the data that's actually encoded in this piece of tape. And a similar thing happens with DNA. And many biologists have pointed out there are actual sequences of DNA that are more stable than other sequences of DNA and less stable and so on. That's gonna cause biases in mutation rates across a stretch of DNA. And there's a bunch of other physical constraints that affect mutations. Some people have built on top of that argument and they say that, you know, genomes could evolve to exploit these natural mutation biases and then optimize the process of evolution. That's a claim that's been debated quite a bit within science. And then finally, you have people outside of science saying that, uh, <laughs> Mutations are willed into existence by the power of the mind. And there are a couple of scientists who have who've claimed things like this. Uh, Rupert, Sh nah, I can't remember the name of the guy. There's a, there's a guy who's in England and he did plant genetics and he, he makes this claim. He's got this kind of a woo-woo uh, genetics that he teaches. As you can tell by the tone of my voice, I don't really take that stuff incredibly seriously, but it would be worth doing a full video where I do take it seriously, at least for that one video, and we analyze, is there a grain of truth in this, at least? But today we're going to ignore that noise. We're going to focus on the first claim here that mutations are maximally random. We will also touch on these other two. Mutations are naturally biased due to physical constraints, and then the idea that natural selection could actually play with this. And we could get what Richard Dawkins calls the evolution of evolvability. So back in the 80s, Richard Dawkins wrote this paper where he claimed that over evolutionary time, the process of evolution can actually get more efficient. Natural selection can drive the process of evolution to greater and greater efficiency, the evolution of evolvability. This new paper in Nature confirms Richard Dawkins' suspicions. Here they claim that this plant actually has a little bit of control over how random its mutations are. Our mission today is to first ask what would maximally random mutations be like? Then we're going to compare that to what mutations are really like. And then finally, and this will actually be for next week, next week's video, what exactly is it that's been recently discovered and published in that Nature Journal? So what is a random process? I know that if I don't talk about this, a bunch of people in the comment section, a bunch of philosophy bros with Greek statues for their profile pictures, they're going to be complaining. They're going to say things like, oh, the rolling of a dice isn't really random. It's predetermined. Everything is determined. The rolling of a die is determined by slight movements of the wrist, slight imperfections in the weight of each die and so on. Yes, I know. I know that a die isn't purely random in a theoretical sense. But when the rest of us talk about randomness, we're talking about that which cannot be confidently predicted. And because this process or this outcome cannot be confidently predicted, we have to use probabilities in order to make any sort of prediction at all. Again, that doesn't mean that if we had perfect knowledge of everything in the universe that we couldn't predict that. 
probably we, we could, but we don't have infinite information about the universe. And so there's lots of things that are random to us. They cannot be confidently predicted. When scientists talk about random mutations, they're usually talking about a change in genome sequence. So a change in the DNA sequence or an RNA sequence in an organism with an RNA genome. Some viruses have RNA genomes. So any change in a genome sequence that the host organism did not actively cause and that has consequences the host organism didn't really predict. Now, of course, organisms don't really predict what mutations are going to do, but over evolutionary time, you can get the evolution of enzymes that behave in a specific way because in the past, behaving that way worked. And you could say that that's a prediction, right? It's a type of prediction in quotes. Random mutations are in contrast to controlled mutations. So a controlled mutation would be a change in genome sequence that a host organism actively caused because similar changes were helpful in the past. And there's examples of all of these. So a random mutation would be UV radiation destroys a short segment of DNA. Then repair enzymes patch that break, but the original sequence is not properly restored. So the end result is a random sequence change. Then you have controlled mutations. Bacteria use CRISPR enzymes to insert short viral sequences into their own chromosomes. Those sequences will be used to fight against future invaders, future virus attacks. And then there's a bunch of different things that we see, the abilities that, that organisms have to manipulate their own genomes that you could call partial control. So bacterial enzymes recognize and then randomly scramble sequences of DNA that have been dangerous in the past. There's a really cool paper called The Genome Strikes Back that outlines a bunch of these evolved systems that can do this. Kind of another way to think of this is that random mutations are things that happen because the world is chaotic. The environment that cells live in, it's a chaotic environment. The internal environment of the cell where the DNA lives, that's a chaotic environment happens, right? <laughs> the controlled and the partially controlled mutations, those are the result of evolved systems, evolved enzymes that can actually actively induce mutations. But even still, are these random mutations maximally random? So even, even when, when nothing is evolved to help control them, are they maximally random? What would maximally random look like? There are lots of different types of mutations. You've got substitutions, insertions, deletions, and so on. To keep things simple here, we're just going to look at substitution mutations. And we're going to look at point mutations, point substitution mutations. So just a single nucleotide is substituted for a different single nucleotide. To keep things simpler still, uh, let's just look at a cartoon version of DNA. And then let's just look at half of that strand of DNA. Keep things really simple here. We'll label it. Now the expectation, if mutations were maximally random, would be that all substitutions are equally likely. I'm showing that here. This is what it would look like if all mutations, all substitutions were equally likely. But in reality, this is not how things actually work. In reality, transition mutations are more common than transversion mutations. You might have noticed that in my, my little cartoon drawing here, T's and C's are just physically smaller than A's and G's are. And that's not just, that's not just an, an accident in how I drew this. That's actually real. In real life, that's the case. A's and G's are larger nucleotides than C's and T's are. And a transition mutation is when a similarly sized nucleotide gets swapped out for a different nucleotide of the same size. So when an A is swapped out for a G, that's a transition mutation. When a C is swapped out for a T, that's a transition mutation. If an A were, is swapped out with a smaller C, that is called a transversion mutation. And it turns out that transversion mutations are really rare. This is a physical bias. It's easier for nucleotides that are the same size to get swapped out for each other. It's just physically easier. The other thing that we would expect if mutations truly were maximally random is we would expect that the mutation rate affecting a genome would be 
completely random, no rhyme or reason to it. In reality, what we see is that mutation rates increase when cells are stressed and decrease when cells are not stressed. This is really interesting and has caused a huge debate. Early on, a lot of people thought that maybe every time we see this, what we're seeing is we're seeing an evolved ability here. So if a cell is stressed out, that must mean that the cell is not fit for its environment. So it would make sense if that cell decided, oh, I should evolve faster now, and it would increase its mutation rate. So a lot of people thought that every time we see this, we're seeing that, oh, the, the cell is trying to control its own evolution. Well, to assume that that's always what's happening here is obviously pretty silly because when cells are stressed out, they simply can't perform well at anything, including maintaining their own DNA. And so when a cell is stressed out, of course, its mutation rate is going to increase because it's not good at doing stuff. If a cell is starved, if it's not getting proper nutrients, well, it can't maintain its genome properly. It can't do the things that it needs to do to keep its DNA safe. So duh, it's... Its mutation rate is going to increase. But because this phenomenon naturally exists, of course it is possible that natural selection could enhance this. And you actually could get cells that actively induce mutations when they're not doing well. They actively induce mutations because in the past, doing this made it so that they could sometimes achieve mutational rescue. This would be an example of the evolution of evolvability. That said, it is pretty dumb to assume that every time we see this, we're seeing an evolved response in action. The third thing that we would expect to be true if mutations were maximally random, we would expect that mutations are equally likely anywhere in an organism's genome. But, alas, this is not the case. There are mutational hotspots and mutational cool spots. And again, this just has to do with the fact that DNA is a physical thing living in a physical environment. The cell is a physical environment. It's a chaotic environment. Certain stretches of DNA are going to be safer than other stretches of DNA just because of the way that they're packaged inside of the cell. I think a lot about the, the penguins that are huddled together in the middle of winter trying to survive. The penguins in the middle, deep in the middle, they're safe. They've got all these penguins around them. The penguins on the outside, they're they're in trouble. And the same is happening in your genome. There are sections of the genome that are just more exposed to danger than other sections of the genome, right? This is just inevitable. This is an inevitable consequence of being a physical thing in the physical world. The question is, has natural selection exploited this fact? Is there a way in which genes that are really important could end up over evolutionary time residing in really secure areas of the genome, while genes or just random stretches of DNA that are not very important would end up taking up the more dangerous areas of the genome. Are there like kings and pawns within the genome? It turns out that there are mechanisms that could cause this to happen. There are certain types of mutations called translocations and transpositions that will shuffle where things are located in the genome, where certain stretches of DNA reside, because those mutations are constantly happening. If you had strong enough selection pressures, you could get natural selection to favor individuals that have their most important genes located in their most secure spots. In our last video, we learned about essential genes. If you didn't watch that, you should go watch that after this one, because it's, it's very important, the concepts that we, we covered there. There are certain genes that are really, really essential. I mean, if you mutate them even just a little bit, the organism can die or the cell can die. It would make a lot of sense for those genes to reside in the safest possible spots of the cell. So could this happen over evolutionary time? The work of Richard Dawkins would suggest that, yeah, that's certainly possible. Other people are saying this is definitely possible and might actually be happening even in the human genome. Here's a paper about that published back in 2004. And then finally, next week, we're going to dive deep into that new nature paper saying that mutations aren't as random as we thought. But today, I just want to recap what we've learned here so far. So are mutations really random? By default, mutations are random. They're random in that they are 
not confidently predictable, but they are naturally biased due to physical constraints. And because of these natural biases, natural selection could harness these biases to optimize the process of evolution. That's hypothetically possible. This would result in the evolution of controlled mutations, the evolution of evolvability. So make sure you're subscribed because next week we're going to look at that new paper and see, has this actually taken place? Has evolvability evolved within the plant Arabidopsis thaliana? <laughs>